Hello, everyone. And happy World Octopus Day. I'm Lisa Levinson, Campaigns Director for In Defense of Animals. We're delighted to co-host this program with Animal Save Movement, Ocean Born Foundation, and Eurogroup for Animals to raise awareness about octopus sentience and to take action to stop octopus farming. We'll start today by sharing our campaigns with you so you can take action. Then we'll enjoy a book reading and a Q&A with the soul of an octopus author, Cy Montgomery. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Katie Nolan with In Defense of Animals and Carrie Tika of Eurogroup for Animals who will tell you how to save octopuses today. First up is Katie Nolan. Hi, Katie. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us today for World Octopus Day. As Lisa said, I'm Katie Nolan. I'm the general campaigner with In Defense of Animals. This year, we're focusing on the end of octopus farming, and we're looking to halt the world's first commercial octopus farm in its tracks. In Defense of Animals is working in collaboration with the Animal Save Movement and Oceanborn Foundation to launch a pressure campaign urging the European Commission and the Spanish Agency for Food Safety and Nutrition to take a stand against industrial octopus farming and Nueva Pescanova, a Spanish multinational corporation planning to launch, launch the world's first octopus farm that aims to market octopus flesh beginning in 2023. So World Octopus Day is both a day of awareness and a day of action, and there's so many ways to get involved. There are protests and events happening all over the world, and you can take part online by joining the tweet storm on the Animal Save Movement World Octopus Day Facebook page and by signing our petitions. We will provide links to everything in the chat, and you can read more about our efforts and how you can get involved by reading In Defense of Animals blog and media release, which we will also put in the chat. There will also be some time for questions at the end of Cy Montgomery's book reading. So if you have any questions throughout our talk, please type them in the Q&A section, and that is at the bottom of your screen. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Carrie with your group for animals. Thank you, Katie and Lisa, and thanks everyone for joining in with us today. Happy World Octopus Day. So as you've heard, I'm Carrie Tietka, and I am the Octopus Project Consultant with your group for animals. To give you some background on our, our organization, Your Group for Animals is an umbrella advocacy organization that has been a leader in animal welfare at the EU level since 1980. We currently represent 85 different member organizations that are active in animal welfare, and we work in a number of different programmatic areas. Um, and through this work, we bring voice to the billions of animals that are kept in laboratories, on farms, and in our homes, as well as those living in the wild. So I'm obviously here to talk about octopuses and our octopus project is a new area of work for your group for animals. Uh, and it is of course in response to the development of this new octopus farming industry. Um, as we are an EU level organization, we work in what we refer to as the Brussels bubble. And so I'm hoping to just bring a little bit of this EU perspective for you today. So to start off in order to do that, I wanna kind of bring the framing of the current legal status here in Europe. Um, and to start off with some good news, uh, recently the European Food Safety Authority has recognized uh, the sentience of octopuses. And this was following a review that was done by the London School of Economics. Um, and I think Sai will get more into this as she does her book reading and touches on the octopuses, um, their sentience and their unique characteristics. But just in case some of you don't know, sentience, re sentience refers to the capability to experience feelings and sensations, including suffering. So this has been really important in terms of creating animal laws and protections. And it's also very important here in the EU where there is a union law that requires the recognition of the sentience of animals. Um, so with that, we'll move into um, laws around octopus farming specifically. And so unfortunately, there are no regulations um, guiding octopus um, welfare in farms. This means that there's nothing guiding how octopuses can be kept in these farms or how they're treated. 
There also is currently no scientifically validated method for the killing of these octopuses. So this means it will lead to a ton of pain and suffering for these octopuses. And actually, as your group for animals, we believe that there is no option for um, high welfare octopus farming. So we're calling for um, a stop to this before the industry even begins. So to get into some of the ways we're doing this, of course, we're taking many different pathways, but one kind of unique to your group for animals is to prevent the flow of funds from going towards octopus farming. We're doing this at the EU level, as well as hoping to create an unfavorable global market for octopus farming. So how we've been doing this is we've been bringing forth several parliamentary questions on the eligibility of using EU funds for octopus farming. And we've also targeted several different funding schemes um, on behalf of your group for animals. Um, so with that, I don't wanna take up too much time. So I will pass it back over to Katie to introduce um, Sai. And I'll also put in links to our work for you all to follow along with what your group for animals is doing. Uh, thanks a lot for listening. Yeah, so it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Sai Montgomery, author of The Soul of an Octopus. Got my copy here, uh, which we're gonna get to hear a little bit about today. Um, Sai is a nature writer who whose work centers around the animal friends she has made, including tigers, gorillas, octopuses, and her pig named Christopher. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Sai. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, Katie and Carrie, and everyone who's joined us. I'm just thrilled to be among kindred spirits who appreciate the magnificence of a creature that was considered a monster. Um, in Western civilization for many centuries. But the truth is utterly different as I began to discover when I started researching The Soul of an Octopus in 2011. The book came out in 2015. And since then, there have been many more studies that testify to the intelligence, the emotionality, um, the problem solving abilities of octopuses. We know even more about them than we did at that time. But when I decided to do my book, I wanted to not just look at the science, although it was important, I think, to talk to so many wonderful scientists, but to also use my own heart as a tool of inquiry and actually get to know some octopuses. It was pretty amazing to be able to say in the course of this book that I had some friends who were octopuses. And to this day, I have octopus friends. So may I begin by just reading you a little bit. You, I hope you like being read to as much as I do. That's what my husband does for me as his Christmas present to me every, every single year. So. Um, I'll start out by just reading from the very beginning of the book, talk a little, read a little more, and then we can talk together. Okay, this is page one, chapter one. On a rare warm day in mid-March, when the snow was melting into mud in New Hampshire, I traveled to Boston where everyone was strolling along the harbor or sitting on benches licking ice cream cones. But I quit the blessed sunlight for the moist, dim sanctuary of the New England Aquarium. I had a date with a giant Pacific octopus. I knew little about octopuses, not even that the scientifically correct plural is not octopi, as I'd always believed. It turns out you can't put a Latin ending I on a word derived from Greek, such as octopus. But what I did know intrigued me. Here is an animal with venom like a snake, a beak like a parrot, and ink like an old fashioned pen. It can weigh as much as a man and stretch as long as your car, yet it can pour its baggy boneless body through an opening as small as an orange. It can change color and shape. It can taste with its skin. Most fascinating of all, I had read that octopuses are smart. 
this bore out what scant experience I already had. Like many who visit octopuses in public aquaria, I'd often had the feeling that the octopus I was watching was watching me back with an interest as keen as my own. How could that be? It's hard to find an animal more unlike a human than an octopus. Their bodies aren't organized like ours. We go head, body, limbs. They go body, head, limbs. Their mouths are in their armpits. They breathe water. Their appendages are covered with dexterous grasping suckers, a structure for which no mammal has an equivalent. So octopuses at that time in 2011 were thought to be as far from humans as possible and without leaving the planet. They are closely related to snails and clams and clams don't even have a brain. But nonetheless, I wanted to reach across that vertebral divide and see if I could meet the mind of someone so different from myself. So this is what happened. Um, my now dear friend, Scott Dowd, who worked in another part of the aquarium, because Athena, their giant Pacific octopus, her actual keeper was not around that day. He opened the lid to her aquarium and I looked in. By the time Scott has popped open the tank, Athena has already oozed from the far corner of her 560 gallon tank to investigate us. Holding to the corner with two of her arms, she unfurls the others, her whole body red with excitement and reaches to the surface. Her white suckers face up like the palm of a person reaching out for a handshake. May I touch her? I ask Scott. Sure, he says. So I take off my wristwatch, remove my scarf, roll up my sleeves and plunge both arms elbow deep into the shockingly cold 47 degree water gelatinous, twisting, her arms boil up from the water, reaching for mine. Instantly, both my hands and forearms are engulfed by dozens of soft, questing suckers. Not everyone I realized would like this. The naturalist and explorer William Beebe found the touch of the octopus repulsive. He wrote, I always have a struggle before I can make my hands do their duty and seize a tentacle, he confessed. The author Victor Hugo imagined such an event as an unmitigated horror leading to certain doom. The specter he wrote lies upon you. The tiger can only devour you, but the devilfish, horrible, sucks your lifeblood away. The muscles swell, the fibers of the body are contorted, the skin cracks under the loathsome oppression, the blood spurts out and mingles horribly with the lymph of the monster. So I could see why not everyone would want to meet an octopus. But Athena's suction on my skin is gentle, though insistent. It pulls me like an alien's kiss. Her melon-sized head bobs to the surface and her left eye, octopuses have a dominant eye as people have dominant hands, swivels in its socket to meet mine. Her black pupil is a fat hyphen in a pearly globe. Its expression reminds me of the look in the eyes of Hindu gods and goddesses, serene, all-knowing, heavy with wisdom, stretching back beyond time. She's looking right at you, Scott says. As I hold her glittering gaze, I instinctively reach to touch her head. Now Hugo had described the flesh of the octopus as, as supple as leather, as tough as steel, and as cold as night. But to my touch, her head is silky and softer than custard. Her skin is flecked with ruby and silver, a night sky reflected on the wine-dark sea. 
As I stroke her with my fingertips, her skin goes white beneath my touch. White is the color of a relaxed octopus. Close relatives of octopus, cuttlefish, the females turn white when they encounter a fellow female, someone whom they need not fight or flee. She seems as curious about me as I am about her. Slowly, she chooses to transfer her grip on me from the smaller outer suckers at the tips of her arms to the larger, stronger ones nearer her head. I find myself bent at a 90 degree angle, folded like a half open book as I stand on the little step stool. I realize what is happening. She's pulling me into her tank. And how happily I would go with her. But alas, I wouldn't fit. Her lair is beneath a rocky um, overhang into which she can flow like water, but I cannot, constrained as I am by bones and joints. The water in her tank would come to chest height on me if I were standing up, but the way she's pulling me, I would be upside down head first in the water and soon facing the limitations of my air hungry lungs. I ask Scott if I should try to detach from her grip. And he gently pulls us apart, her suckers making popping sounds like small plungers as my skin is released. So I had an encounter with Fina that day, which I felt was very interesting to us both. I felt absolutely no trace of anger or fear from her. I didn't know for sure that I'd be able to fear to feel anger or fear from an invertebrate because all of my friends are vertebrates, really. Um, I, I haven't known um, many invertebrates well enough to be able to tell, but I could tell. And now it's known why this should be. Our emotions and octopus emotions are extremely similar. And we know this from a variety of tests. Um, one of the uh, experiments that scientists have done um, would be you know, a behavioral kind of experiment. Does an octopus like you? Does it choose to come towards you or go away from you? Does an octopus recognize individuals and like some and dislike others. We now know that is true because it has been tested scientifically. Identically dressed volunteers at Seattle Aquarium, this is just one of the experiments, um, were given, some of them were given a bristly stick with which they consistently always touched the octopus. Others were given a delicious fish, which they fed the octopus. So the octopuses just looking up through the water, looking at our faces, were able to tell and recognize, oh, there's my friend with a delicious fish. But then they'd see the one who touched them with a bristly stick, which isn't painful, but no one likes it. And they would move away. And some of them would move away after squirting freezing cold water into their face at first. In many cases, they would make an eye bar they would um, create a pattern on their face, which is known to be associated with fear. What else do we know about octopus emotions? Well, our emotions are accompanied by various hormones um, and chemicals released by our brain into our blood. And this can be measured in blood and saliva and other fluids. It can also be measured in octopuses. And they possess all the same hormones that we do associated with happiness, with fear, um, and even the um, so-called cuddle hormone, oxytocin, which you may have heard of. Oxytocin uh, is released when we mammals nurse our babies. It's released when we see someone we love. It's an affiliation hormone. And even though octopuses do not care for their young for more than the second or two it takes to blow the paralarvae of the just hatched eggs out into the sea before the mother dies, they have a hormone so like our oxytocin that it's called cephalotocin. It's almost exactly the same. 
So these are two ways in which we easily measure that octopuses have emotion as we do. Now, unfortunately with Athena, one of the very sad things to us about octopuses is that they only live a few years. They accomplish their whole lives in between three and five years. They start out as little tiny paralarvae. They hatch from eggs the size of a grain of rice. And their, their first years are lived as plankton in the sea. There have been very few, in fact, only one that I know of, uh, cases of successfully hatching baby giant Pacific octopus in aquaria. So by the time you see an octopus, a giant Pacific in, in an aquarium, that animal is probably two or three years old. And you may only get to know that individual for another two years before they reach the end of their natural life cycle. And Athena, alas, after just a couple more visits, she died of old age. I wondered, I wanted to believe she recognized me when I went back, but I couldn't be absolutely sure. But with the next octopus who I met shortly after she arrived at the aquarium, I could be sure. I knew she knew me. In the, in the beginning, uh, we had a little bit of, of trouble. She was nervous about me, understandably, but we got to know each other so well that whenever I would open her tank, she would rush over. Literally, I would rush into her, her arms and she would rush into my arms. And one time when I was away from another um, expedition that I had to do for a different book, I'd been away for a couple of weeks. You know how you feel when you haven't seen your friend and you come back together? Well, this scene, which was not just witnessed by me, but others at the aquarium, we just flew into each other's arms. We're really glad to see each other. Now, why would that be? Well, it's not that I'm a nicer person or possess any special talents any more than anybody else. But what I had to offer Octavia and the other octopuses with whom I became friends was we liked to play together. And octopuses are so smart that you need to keep them occupied. This is why all aquariums that have one have an octopus enrichment manual so that they have interesting things to do. In fact, in aquaria, octopuses may have more interesting things to do than they do in the wild. And the reason is that in the wild, so far, the studies that we've done show that they're hiding from predators like 70 to 90% of the time, just huddling in their lairs thinking, oh my gosh, someone's gonna come and eat me. But they don't have that worry in, in the aquarium. So, you know, they love toys. More evidence that this animal who is so unlike us shares with us so much of its mental life. They love to play with the same toys our children do. They love to open puzzles. They love to play with uh, Mr. Potato Head. They like taking Mr. Potato Head's eyes and ears off and moving them around. And we invented a number of toys just to please and occupy our octopus. So what I had to offer Octavia and the others was not my charming personality or, you know, my bright blue coat, but what I had to offer her was, it was time to play. At the aquarium, you know, the, the Aquarius there have lots of other animals to take care of. But I came every week, sometimes more than once, and just played. And we had such a good time together. Now, you may know that octopuses have blue blood, not red blood like ours. And the reason for that is that the um, oxygen carrying component of their blood is not iron as is ours, but it is copper. And for this reason, octopuses tire after 45 minutes to an hour, then they, they need a rest. Octopuses in the wild, of course, have to spend a lot of time hiding from predators, but they also spend time resting from their exertions as they hunt other creatures. 
So probably, you know, playing for an hour a day, um, it was like having a really strenuous basketball tournament or something. Um, and we both enjoyed it. Now, getting to know somebody who is in an artificial situation in captivity, it can be very rewarding for both animals, me and Octavia and Kali and Karma and the others who I've come to know. But I also really wanted to meet an octopus in the wild. I, I, it's hard to study them as you can well imagine. It's hard to even know like which octopus this is. It's very hard to count them. It's like, oh, they, there's one octopus, it's brown and it's this big and its skin is nice and smooth. But a second later, you can see a red octopus who's smaller with bumps all over its skin. That might be the same octopus you just saw over here. It's just changed color and shape. And they don't stay in the same layer for very long. So you can look in one layer where you found an octopus today and tomorrow that octopus won't be there. But I was so determined to try to meet an octopus on their own terms, to try to touch the realm where my friend Octavia had lived, that um, in my 50s, I finally learned to scuba dive. And I have a request uh, to read a little bit from what I discovered meeting octopuses in the wild for the first time. At first, I should confess to you that I'm a really bad scuba diver. I was very, very new. And there were many times that I, I felt like I was drowning or that I was going to shoot to the top because I couldn't get my buoyancy right. But I got to say, it was so worth it. It was worth that risk. It was worth the exhausting effort to, to find out a little bit of what my friend's life had been like before I even met her. And I'm gonna read from um, my first dive at night. It's getting dark and cold. We wait for an hour topside, off-gassing the nitrogen built in our blood. My instructor, Big D, and I huddle beneath a shared towel, shivering and giggling. Now I'm nervous. My ears hurt. It's dark. It's night. And this is the ocean. Our dive master convenes the dive briefing. We're almost there, he says. The place we're coming to is called Paradiso. Of all the places in Cozumel, Mexico, this is the place of the night dive. But every night you're here is different. I think we are going to see octopus and shark. On the full moon, the octopus is out because he is a predator and the moon is his strobe. But lobsters will stay in their hole. You may see huge crabs. You may see large squid. There are eels the sharp-tailed eel who looks like a snake. So he said, we'll meet at the surface first at the back of the boat and go down together. Get your light on. When you use hand signals, light your hand. And when you surface, when you come up, shine the light on your head so the boat can find you. Okay, let's go. We each have two lights, a flashlight and a glow stick on our backs. I stride in right after Rob because of the problems with the shore night dive in which I actually got lost from my group. Rob decides to hold my hand throughout the dive. We descend slowly. My ears squeal, but unless the pain is shattering, I am gonna continue. Finally, Rob and I are on the bottom with the others. We proceed along the reef in the dark. I'm so glad he's holding my hand because I'm finding it very difficult to adjust my buoyancy, use my flashlight to see my depth gauge, clear my ears and sometimes my mask and look for animals in the small disk of light from my flashlight. 
It feels as if I'm traveling in a small capsule in outer space. Around me, the darkness is heavy and enveloping. My senses have constricted and intensified to focus only on this tiny circle of light. And here, it reveals a huge crab, a tall purple turret of coral, a bright blue angelfish, a school of snapper mass beneath a coral, a spiny lobster waves its antenna. Ahead, there's flashes of light, like heat lightning from my friend's cameras, contrails of light trailing from their buoyancy vests. And then an octopus. I squeeze Rob's hand, but he's already seen it oozing from its hole. It's brown with white stripes, then becoming lighter as its arms boil up out of its lair. Three arms walk forward. He turns green, then brown and then he disappears. Marvels flash before me in the circle of my light. A sharp-tailed eel, its tail a flat paddle pointed at the tip. Striped grunts, so named for the grinding they make with their teeth. A bright blue angelfish, a huge crab. The pressure in my ears is building. I'm having trouble focusing my attention. I constantly blow out of my nose, trying to equalize, but instead create a bizarre underwater soundtrack inside my head, squeals and bubblings accompanying the Darth Vader hissing of my regulator. If it were not for Rob's hand holding mine, I'd be completely disoriented. And then another octopus, this time on a reef wall. This one is small and shy, and all I see are eyes and suckers peering from a hole in the corals. My ears are screaming. Rob gives the thumbs up, it's time to surface. I ascend with him slowly, like a dying soul reluctant to leave its body. And we watch the silver trail of our bubbles rising above us like shooting stars. It meant so much to me to be in that ocean realm. It was like visiting the hometown of a friend you've loved for a long time. And when I got back to see Octavia again, it was a wonderful reunion. We really were good friends. And I'm not just projecting that. And here's how I know. Those of you who've read the book will know already some of the last words I used to conclude the book, but it is the story of when she became old and sick and was in her final days. She was, um, she was moved from being on exhibit because normally their layers are very dark and um, they stay in their lair when they're old and dying. She'd laid eggs, but they were infertile. And um, I think also just for basic dignity, um, they wanted to keep her in a, a quiet, safe, dark place in her last days. I should also mention that while she was on her eggs, which was for over nine months, during that time, they don't eat, they don't leave their lair, they stay with their eggs. And so I hadn't played with her or even looked into her face from above in 10 months, really. And for an animal who lives only three to five years, 10 months is decades. I wasn't even sure that she would remember me. But this is what happened when I went behind the scenes to check on my friend for what I knew might be one of the last times. As Krista and Brendan, volunteers there, stood back and watched, Wilson, my very good friend and a real octopus whisperer, and I unscrewed the lid from the top of her tank. Octavia was coiled and calm, a brownish maroon color at the bottom. 
her left swollen eye faced away and her right eye seeming normal seemed large and alert. Wilson offered her a large squid in his right hand. Within, eight, within 20 seconds, she flipped upside down and floated up three quarters of the way to the surface, showing us her lacy white suckers. Wilson plunged his hand into the cold water to place the squid against the large suckers. She grabbed it. I put my hand in as well, both of us offering our skin for her to taste. Would she accept us again? Would she remember? She rose a few inches in the water and hundreds of her suckers broke the surface. She gently grasped the back of Wilson's hand, first with just a few suckers, then with more. And then slowly but deliberately, she extended one arm out of the water, curling up over his hand, his wrist, and next her neighboring arm followed rising and unfurling like a wine dark wave her suckers attached to his wrist and forearm. She knows you, cries, cries Krista. She remembers you, Wilson. And next, still embracing Wilson with her two arms, she did the same to me. First with one of her arms on my right arm, then two arms on my left. Her wet grip on my skin felt gentle and familiar, the pull of her suckers tender as a kiss. None of us spoke as she held us. She held us for five minutes. Or was it 10? Who knew? We were then on octopus time. Hanging upside down, Octavia offered us her white suckers and we stroked them and she latched onto our fingertips. Gently, she blew from her siphon, but unlike the blasts of icy salt water she used to shoot in play, they barely rippled the surface. Her arms were so relaxed that we could see the very tip of her beak, a black speck at the joining point of all her limbs, like the center of a flower. She's very gentle, said Wilson. She's very calm. She never ate that squid that was offered to her. She came to us not because she was hungry. The reason she surfaced was abundantly clear. She had not interacted with us or tasted our skin or seen us above her tank for 10 full months. She was sick, she was weak, and soon she would be dead. Yet despite everything, we knew in that moment that Octavia had not only remembered us and recognized us, she had wanted to touch us again. This is why we should not subject these intelligent, sensitive creatures to factory farming, which by the way, is no good for any species whatsoever. There are so many delicious things for humans to eat in this world. We do not need to eat the flesh of these beautiful creatures and we certainly do not have to subject them to the horrors of factory farming to do so. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sai, for, for reading this. That was absolutely wonderful. I think we have some time for Q and A if um, people have questions. And the so questions again, need not just be for me because Katie, they may have questions um, about the campaign and what they can do and other things as well. So hang in there with me. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so if anyone has questions about anything for Sai about the book, um, about the different campaigns, you can, um, click that Q&A button and ask your question there. And I think uh, Lisa will be checking for questions on the Facebook live stream as well. So we have had a couple questions come in already. Um, one is, how is an octopus brain distributed throughout its body? 
and how can we make comparisons between its physiological makeup in regards to common attributes of human mammal mammalian brains? Great question. Their, their brains are so different from ours that I, I could totally understand earlier scientists not even seeing the brain. Their brain is a ring around their throat. Our brain, as you know, it looks sort of like a shelled walnut, um, the shell being our skull. Of course, they have no skull. We have four lobes in our brain. They have so many lobes, we aren't even sure how many there are, 50 to 75 in the giant Pacific octopus, but scientists are still arguing about this. And they appear to have sort of an equivalent of, brain, of a brain in each of their eight arms because their arms can go off and do stuff without sending information to the central brain. And one of the ways that one can observe this is, um, as, as you know, octopuses in, in the wild have many predators and um, sometimes a predator will bite off an arm. The octopus can regrow it, but meanwhile, the severed arm can go off and do stuff and it can do stuff like hunt. Now to no avail because now the arm is separated from the three hearts and the, the digestive organs and all that kind of stuff. So that arm is just doomed, but it's still thinking about stuff and it's still doing things. Um, so many times uh, scientists and, and philosophers too make this mistake. We make ourselves the yardstick of all knowledge and wisdom. Mm -hmm. And this mistake has led us to for one thing, dismiss the intelligence of birds. Well, birds, we now know, you know, use tools and have incredible memories and have powers of, of navigation that we can't even approach and so on and so forth. But for the longest time during my lifetime, um, people thought birds did not have uh, like a thinking part in their brain at all. And the problem was that our scientists' brains couldn't figure out where the thinking part was because it didn't look like ours. And we've made that same mistake with other people, as you know. You know, um, when the folks in charge are one race or sex, they can decide that those of other races or sexes um, are lacking in, I mean, for the longest time, in certain societies, women didn't have any souls. And there were all, remember the so-called science of phrenology that there were like bumps on your head and this could tell if you were a good person. Well, that like, of course, proved that any person of color had no sense at all, crazy. But we're prone to these assumptions. Yeah, wow. Uh, we've got questions rolling in. Um, there have been a couple about um, octopuses in captivity. Uh, someone wants to know if you felt sad about Octavia being confined. And another person asks if there are disadvantages of having octopuses in captivity. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And I, I figured that, that folks would ask that. I'm glad that you did. Um, it's such an interesting philosophical question. Philosophically, it's wrong to capture and enslave anybody. However, we have so wrecked the ocean. We have so ruined the world for, for animals of all kinds that actually being in a good aquarium in captivity is probably almost the second best option available to any octopus. Most octopuses, there's um, octopuses, giant Pacific octopuses lay 100,000 eggs. All but two of those babies who hatch will be torn limb from limb, killed and eaten, either by natural predators or by fishermen who cut off their squirming limbs to use for bait or who eat them. Um, we have polluted the ocean so badly that by 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. So given the world that we live in for many animals, as, as long as we provide what they need, they can live a 
better life in captivity than in our polluted, overcrowded, um, dangerous, filled with hunters, paved over, wrecked world. And I wish it weren't so. Um, but I feel Octavia had an, an interesting life. She didn't have to spend 70 to 90% of her time hiding from predators in her, in her lair. She didn't have to worry about a fish hook getting caught in her or, you know, somebody coming and tearing her limb from limb and, and eating her. But again, you know, if, if we take an animal out of the wild or even if we breed them in captivity, we, we owe them a good life because now they're our charge. Just like if you bring a child into this world, that kid did not ask to be born. You know, no animal ever, except for dogs, dogs did choose to be dogs and not wolves. So they chose our company. But most animals um, don't necessarily choose our company. And just like when we bring a child into this world, we owe them something really big and we owe them a terrific life. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there have been a couple questions coming in about the campaign specifically. Um, what can people do to help and whether the octopus farm can be stopped via permitting. And um, again, how else can we stop the factory farming of the octopuses after already signing petitions? Um, I'll just start by saying uh, the petitions that we have are linked in the chat. Uh, we have a blog and a media release that also detail other ways you can help and how to host your own event and help educate your friends and community circles about octopuses and how intelligent of creatures they are. Um, a couple other events happening around the world that you can join. I'm not sure that a lot of them are still going on, but um, I think there might be some. I know there, there is a protest in Los Angeles. So if you're in that area, we have information on one of our pages on that. Um, Carrier side, I don't know if you have anything to add about how to how to stop octopus factory farming, or if Carrie, you want to talk about um, what your organization's working on more. Sure. So um, I guess to address the question on the permits, so this first farm in Spain is pretty far along in the process. There have been challenges brought forth, um, mainly led by the animalist political organization in Spain called PACMA. They've challenged mostly on environmental grounds, but unfortunately the um, Spanish environmental agencies have mostly dismissed these challenges. So organizations are still working together as there are still some outstanding permits. There might be a chance to, if not stop the opening of this first farm to at least slow it down as much as possible and send a signal to any other farms trying to open and let them know that there is gonna be pushback, there are gonna be hurdles. Um, and that people are watching and are opposed to this. Um, so in terms of our own campaigns, we'll be moving forward with that as we get going with our work. This is a new program, but if you look on our website, you'll be made aware of our specific campaign actions that come up. Um, so that would be great for ways to get involved. Um, and then of course, also um, in your parts of the world, as these farms start to open, make sure you're aware and petition and um, use your voice as well in your areas because there are farms um, looking to open in the US as well as Mexico and Japan. So we'll be monitoring all of these and be putting together campaigns and ways for you to get involved. Awesome, thank you. And Sai, I don't know if you have anything to add about um, ending octopus farming. Well, we all, I mean, first of all, my hat's off to you. Thank you, both of you, um, Carrie and, and Katie for what you're doing, it's so important. And all of us have a lot of power to help this world just in the everyday choices that we make. And I've, I've found just in sharing with, uh, I've heard from so many people like, I can't eat octopus anymore. You ruined it for me by writing your book. Same thing happened when I wrote my book, The Good Good Pig about Christopher Hogwood. I mean, there must be a fatwa on me from the National Pork Council. Um, so I think just by, by witnessing um, in, a, in a kind way to others about how wonderful these, these animals are. No, 
no one needs to, to kill and eat them. Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know, do we have time for one more question? I do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I just, I love this. Someone asked in the chat, uh, do we know if octopuses can dream? And there was another question about what do we know about how octopuses communicate with each other? Mm. Um, yeah, octopuses almost certainly do dream. And we know this because when they are asleep, you can see them changing colors. And I, I've seen, Aristotle could see dogs dream and commented on it. We've all seen dogs and cats dream and they're twitching their paws and often making little sounds. Well, I saw an electric eel dream. I put that in the book. The, uh, the eel was asleep and there was a voltmeter at the aquarium. And even though it was catching and Z's, I mean, it was asleep. The voltmeter kept doing this and this and this. Well, that meant that it was throwing out electricity, searching as if it was searching for prey. Well, if you're an electric eel, what do you dream about? Searching and catching prey. If you're an octopus, what do you dream about? Well, changing colors so you can sneak up on someone and eat them or changing colors so you can escape from somebody else. Um, there's some, fabulous uh, footage of octopuses interacting with other octopuses in a place called Octopolis, which I am desperate to go to, and perhaps I'm going to get a chance to in the next couple of years. Um, it's in Australia, and it's an aggregation of octopus tetricus, which is known as the gloomy octopus, although they're not really gloomy, they just have really big expressive eyes. And they are constantly doing stuff with other octopuses. And one of the things they do is um, Peter Godfrey Smith is, is one of the researchers. David Shield is, is another one who works there. Um, they've put all these GoPros around to film stuff. And one of the things that often films is that one octopus steals the GoPro from another octopus. Um, also, when they, they try to intimidate other octopuses, they rise up, they turn black, they look just like Darth Vader's helmet. I mean, it would scare the hell out of you if you were a person. Well, if you're an octopus, it must be really terrifying. And so they do communicate with each other. We just don't have sense enough quite yet to figure out what they're saying. That's amazing. <laughs> well, um, I think we're pretty much out of time, but thank you everyone for your questions. I'm sorry if we uh, didn't get to all of them. Um, and thank you, Sai, for, for answering all of them and for reading. This was so great. My, my pleasure. And thank you for all you're doing. And happy World Octopus Day to everyone. Well, we're absolutely thrilled. This is Lisa popping back in from In Defense of Animals. We're so thrilled that everyone could join us today because this is the beginning of raising awareness about octopus sentience and also for taking action from this day forward. So we hope that you'll join in to all the actions that we share with you on the chat. And also, if you haven't read Sai's book, please do so. It's an amazing book. And also I learned so much even more from this webinar today from hearing what Sai had to share with us. I'm so moved. It was very fascinating. So I wanna thank you, Sai, on behalf of all of our organizations in defense of animals, Animal Save Movement, Born Free Foundation, and Eurogroup for Animals. And special thanks to Carrie and to Katie for sharing about the campaigns that are actively working to, to save octopus and to stop octopus farming worldwide. This is a really important time in history because we want to stop this before it becomes common practice. And we need all of you to help, help us do that. So thank you to everyone for joining in, for spending some time together uh, and also learning more about octopuses. This is really exciting. And I wanna thank everyone really from the bottom of our hearts. We know that we have one, but octopuses have three, <laughs> which is so, so interesting. And so let's, um, on behalf of all three of their hearts and one of ours, thank you all for joining us today. Take care and enjoy Octopus Day. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Happy Bye. Octopus Day.
Mm-hmm.